Good, so hello, how are you? Still have enough energy to survive until the end of the conference? Good, good, good. It's Saturday, I know, but, uh, but uh, let's use the time that we are together. Actually, I'm really, I really like to speak in or be in, in, in such a community co conference. It's, it's, I much more like it than, than the more formal ways because actually here you have much more chance to talk with each other and uh, and I also like very much that, uh, that also the speakers, some of them are really practitioners and, and they are sharing what, what, uh, their own experience. So, so I'm really glad also to our sponsors that, uh, that make this, made this happen. Uh, good, so now or today we will talk about behavior driven development and spec flow. How many of you have heard about spec flow? Many of you, good, good. good. Uh, how many of you have heard about behavior driven development in general? Good, okay. So, so these will be the topics for today. Uh, before I jump into that, uh, let me just uh, briefly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Gaspar Nagy. Uh, Nagy is a Hungarian name because I'm Hungarian. It's impossible to pronounce anyone who is not Hungarian, but it's a very common last name. Actually, it means big, so it's the most common last name, in fact, in Hungary. So. Uh, I started my career as a software developer, and I still feel like a software developer, but uh, like um, eight years ago, I was just suddenly jumping into the, the testing space where uh, I started to work on, on an open source project called SpecFlow. And uh, through that and uh, through the opportunities I got uh, uh, through this open source project, basically I, it's also changed my professional life. And, uh, and uh, now, Nowadays, I'm working as a, as a trainer or consultant or coach or how you want to call it. And uh, basically, I can now spend the, uh, my entire professional time uh, or working time for BDD and Spectral. I'm really glad for that. So open source projects are, can be really, really cool. And uh, I mean, this is also very good that, uh, that uh, in the previous talk, we have seen a couple of other uh, examples of, of very good and very important uh, open source projects. So <clears throat> I do a lot with behavior driven development and uh, uh, I try to follow the interesting news, inter interesting articles about BDD. And uh, uh, I, since I'm trying to collect month by month the, the interesting articles that I'm reading or blog posts, I decided that, okay, if I'm anyway doing that, why not share with others? So actually I started a, a free newsletter which is called BDD Addict. Uh, if you go to bdaddyaddict.com, you can see the previous issues or you can subscribe. Basically, it's a monthly newsletter where I just have a four, five, six uh, recommended article in a topic of uh, behavior-driven development, test automation, cucumber, spec flow, and all around this. So if you are interested about that, yeah, just uh, go ahead and subscribe. It's, it's really free. Good. The other thing that I should probably mention about myself, especially because I'm really proud of that, that uh, uh, we are currently, or we were working with Seb Rose on a book which is about uh, behavior driven development. Actually, it's a book series at the end, uh, and this is the first piece of that. Uh, and this first piece is focusing on the collaboration aspect of BDD. Right now, as far as I know, this is the only printed version of that, so currently it's only available as, a, as an ebook. But uh, by, by, by the end of the year, we will also have uh, printed copies as well. Still, if you just want to grab the ebook, go to bddbooks.com and, uh, and uh, you will find it on, on LeanPub. Uh, and of course, if you have any feedback or, uh, about that, I'm really glad to hear about it. So this is about myself and uh, let's rather see what we will do today. So, Actually, if I would need to summarize this talk, then I would say that this talk is about quality, how quality is related to test automation and how you can do or what could be the good strategies for test automation. And, how, and finally, how this leads us to behavior driven development and, and spec flow. Uh, the course we are, the, the, the session will be more like that, that uh, in the first topic, uh, I have some slides and I will show you some examples for that and for the BDD. I have prepared a uh, quick de demo that, uh, where, so I can really show you how spec flow works and how, what is the rhythm, how, how, what is the typical workflow, how people can use spec flow. Okay, ready? Let's go. So, uh, 
So here we should start with the question that why the quality is, a, is at all important, especially for mobile development. And I think it's a pretty obvious question. Yeah, quality. You want to have quality. And uh, for that, I try to come up with a quadrant. I mean, uh, quadrants are very good. Don't take this very serious. But my quadrant has, uh, has these uh, uh, four blocks. And actually, in the, in the uh, vertical space is about how much quality is important for us. Of course, quality is important for all kinds of applications, but there are some applications where it's just important, and there, is, there are some applications where it's really important, let's say it like that, or critical. On the other axis is that about testability, and especially in terms of automation. So some applications are easier to test, some applications are harder to test. And if you try to think about uh, where you place your application within these quadrants, then uh, you will probably find uh, uh, where it fits. I was also trying to think about that where, what are the typical applications are, are placed in here. Of course, this is a generalization, so every individual application can be different. But if, for example, think about this uh, uh, left up corner, so the critical but relatively easy to automate, then maybe, if, for example, some financial applications uh, uh, could be placed here. Typically, in the financial applications, the quality is very important because if you make a mistake, that typically costs a lot of money. However, since this is about numbers and, I mean, uh, uh, and then the algorithms, it's slightly uh, easier to automate than, than other applications. Or if you think about frameworks, where frameworks are typically solving some, well, at least the good frameworks, are typically solving some very special problem, uh, you can more or less, uh, as, as you go, uh, wrap them up with, with, with good tests. If you think about the other end, so the, the, uh, the ones where the quality is probably not so uh, critical, however, this is hard to test, then at least in my experience, typically these intranet applications are, are there which need to be integrated with many other legacy systems within the company. However, maybe there are not so many users are using them and, uh, and maybe it's not part of the, the, the company's internal process. Desktop applications uh, can be there, of course, depending on how many users do you have, but uh, uh, I'm probably not Visual Studio, what we are talking about here, but something like that. Sometimes development tools are also like that. So uh, SpecFlow, at least for SpecFlow Visual Studio ex extension can be also seen like that, that um, uh, not so easy to test because uh, it connects many different things, or, but, uh, but uh, or hard to test again, and, uh, but, uh, but the quality is not so crucial. OK, uh, <clears throat> on the right up uh, side, there are, this is a tricky part. And uh, for example, typical microservice uh, applications are at least nowadays there because uh, microservices in architecture is pretty new. There are not so well established testing techniques for that. And, uh, and it's, it's not so easy to, to come up with a good testing strategy or single page applications where the browser and all the asynchronous uh, steps are making it harder, ah, more or less like that. If you think about mobile, just where would you place it? especially mobile apps that are on the, on the App Store. Yeah, you, you, hmm? Bottom left. Yeah, <laughs> very good. Uh, so probably there are some trivial app, mobile apps which are easy to test, but I think the majority of the mobile apps are, are belonging on, on, to the right up corner because uh, for mobile apps, typically the quality is very important because, because uh, because of the, the, the app stores and because of the rating systems and because of the, how the community is influencing the, the success of the project, making any mistake can be really, uh, really uh, bad and, uh, and you can really quickly lose the, the interest of your, or, of your audience or your, or your potential audience. So, so you really have to be careful what you are publishing to the app store. So somehow the quality should be quite important. And on the other hand, testing is absolutely not easy, I, I think. If uh, any of you thinks that, uh, that uh, general mobile apps are easy to test, uh, then we, please just come to me afterwards. I, I would like to talk to you. <laughs> Good. So, so this is our topic. So we would like to. We have a. We have a, 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 some development space where where the quality is important and and it's not so easy to automate or not so easy to test that. So that's why that's why we would like to look at that. You can also think about what comes in the left down corner. I will leave it up to you. Maybe the conference session demos are there. Uh, 
So, okay, quality is important, but what is quality? It's a very simple question, but it's not so easy to answer. Shall I just give you like a, 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 a 20 seconds? You think about what if you would need to come up with a definition of quality, what would you come up with? Just think about that for a moment. Waterfall. Don't say it, just think. <laughs> So actually, it's not so easy to define that. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, if you, for example, search for it in Google, so type in uh, so what is software quality in Google, that what comes out is a IS2QB site. IS2QB is a, is a testing uh, certificate system, whatever. So it's quite obvious that they should provide some definition on, on quality. And they have an article which is even titled like that, what is software quality? However, if you read that, then the first sentence is that, so what is software quality? Quality software is a reasonably bug or defect free, blah, 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 blah. Okay, uh, this is, was not the question. I know what quali uh, quality software is, but what is software quality? That's a completely different question. And uh, fortunately, if you scroll down and skip all the adverts, then it also gives you a definition of software quality as well, based on some standard. It says that, it says that the totality of features and characteristics of a product or service bears in its ability to satisfy stated or implied needs. That's not really helpful, especially because it says that stated or implied needs, so that's, that's very dangerous because it seems that, that quality is not just what people are saying, that, uh, so that's okay, the expectations that, uh, for your application, but there are a lot of implied quality criteria as well that uh, no one says loud, but it should be there, so that's not so easy. So it looks like that uh, defining quality is not, uh, is not an easy topic. Still, interestingly, we try to measure it. And, uh, and uh, there are different measurements that you are typically do for quality, but I think none of them are really good or not, none of them are really satisfaction, satisfactory. So typically, sometimes measured as a number of bugs, but this is very bad because if you don't have, if you have a low number of bugs, this can also mean that your, your product is really good or your testing team is too lazy, right? So it's uh, not really a good measure. Number of tests, sometimes you measure the quality is that oh, how many tests do you have? That's a typical question that you ask, but unfortunately it's very hard to say what is the good number of tests, right? So if, you are, if, if, a, if a software would need like 100 tests, then if you have 1,000 tests, then probably this is even worse than having 100 tests. Typically there are some coverage metrics that are uh, like uh, test coverage. However, the problem with this is that just because if you have 80% 80 cover, 80 coverage on your, in your application by unit test, this doesn't make it quality. Probably if you have zero, that's more of a danger, but just this number doesn't really give you any, 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 any value. Similarly to code metrics, there are also production issues, which is probably a good measure, especially if you have a large enough code uh, user base. However, the problem with the production issues is that it's too late. So until you realize that your product sucks because there are a lot of production issues, then probably your users anyway turned away already. So, so that's uh, uh, also not really a good uh, uh, measure. I, don't, I can't give you a, a good definition about uh, quality, but, but somehow my feeling is that quality is more related to the confidence, the confidence of you, how much you think that you, what you have produced is really a good thing. So from this perspective, and uh, I was really trying this out in a, in a few projects, probably the best quality measure of your application is if you are trying to ask your developers how do they feel, just rating every, every week, and, uh, and uh, this will be very well correlating to the, uh, to the quality of, the, of your product. Just make sure that you don't combine it with the bonus system, so, because otherwise they will fake it, so uh, good. <clears throat> okay, so quality is somehow related to confidence, and if you think about testing, how testing comes to that point, so testing itself doesn't produce quality, right? It just increases your confidence or, or establishes your confidence that, uh, that your product is better. And based on this thinking, you can't really know uh, how many tests uh, you need. It depends on the team, it depends on the situation. And uh, 
okay, if we would like to ensure our, our, our confidence by tests, then of course the other question is, okay, what kind of test do I need? And the typical question that, 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 that people are asking each other, do you have unit tests? And no, 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 we don't, we, we just make it. Uh, do you have UI tests? No, we do it in another way. And you always feel bad that, okay, the other has unit tests, I don't have unit tests, or is this good or bad? So let's try to dig into this and let's try to find an answer. What kind of test do we need to ensure the quality? I will not, to ab not be able to tell you the, the full recipe, but at least a, a way of, of thinking about that. So if you think about different kinds of tests, then you probably have heard about the testing pyramid or test automation pyramid. How many of you have heard about that? Good. Uh, so the test automation pyramid was introduced by Mike Cohn in the, in the book called uh, Succeeding with Agile, and I really recommend you to read that chapter which is talking about that. Uh, the concept of the pyramid is very simple. Doesn't, make, doesn't mean that it will be, it's very simple to apply that, but the concept of that is very simple. So you might have unit tests, you might have uh, some middle layer tests, and you have some UI or end-to-end -end tests, and the unit tests are fast and cheap, the UI tests are slow and costly, so you probably ha should have a lot of unit tests and you, have, you should have a, uh, much less UI tests because otherwise uh, your testing costs are too high. Okay, so this is the, the, the basic uh, uh, concept of that. However, unfortunately, this is not giving us the answer what, uh, what kind of test do we need. It just more just gives us, gives us a feeling that whether our, whether our, our balance is, uh, is good or, or, or we have an off balance in terms of testing. So this is what we would like to see. <clears throat> to, be, to, to look at that different kinds of tests that, that we might need, mm -hmm. maybe we cannot answer what quality is, but maybe we can just uh, dig into the different aspects of quality, different uh, 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 parts of that, and, and see what kind of tests are better suited for that. And this is just my classification, it's a very simple one. Uh, you can come up with your own as well. So in my thinking, one aspect of the quality, which is like you can call functional quality, is about whether your, your application is really working as expected. So typically these are the functional tests. Uh, but when I say it works as expected, I also mean that, and it's clear what is expected, and it's somehow well known or documented what is expected. That's also belonging to the, the functional quality. If no one knows what is the expected behavior, it's very hard to make a test because I always, it, it will be always questioned that, uh, that this test is good or not. So this is the functional quality. You have another kind of quality, which I call it usability. It's not the perfect word for that, but this is where, where I say that, okay, it's already functioning, but, uh, but whether it's secure, fast, convenient to use, uh, looks pretty, consistent, predictable, whatever other uh, uh, concerns that you typically uh, would like to address with, a, with, a, with an application. And in my classification, there is a third one as well, which is I call strategic. And if you think about that, that, just think about these first two. So you can have an application which is functioning well, it's convenient, secure, and everything is fine. Actually, when I was young, around age of 60, uh, uh, 16, uh, I started to do computer programming and uh, I, I jumped into making some computer games. So my, one of my first games was a Tetris. And uh, I just looked back into the code a few years later and I just realized that the anti-Tetris game was a single method. It was working fine, but nobody could touch that. It's, it was not a code base that was really maintainable. So if I would need to, if I would want to make a business out of my Tetris app, then, then I would, need to in, would have needed to increase its quality, a different aspect of the quality, a kind of strategic quality, that I can't just maintain it now, but I can also maintain it in the future. And this is where good architecture, code quality, and all these things are coming into the picture, right? So, so this is, without strategic, strategic quality, you can survive now, but if you want to survive tomorrow, then, uh, then, then you also need to, uh, uh, this. Okay, so if you are finding some aspects of the quality, uh, then you can also have a rating of uh, how much important these different aspects in your application. Mm. I will look a little bit more in detail in the, in the functional quality because this is what uh, leads us to, to BDD at the end. And uh, let's imagine a very specific scenario within our application. So I would like to test whether I'm able to 
I will, my demo will be a pizza ordering application where I'm able to uh, select a pizza and put it into my basket. This is a very concrete scenario. If I would like to make a test for that, in which level should I put that test? UI, right? This is a functional test. I would like to ensure the functional quality. Functional quality that means that it, it works as expected. It works as my users expecting it. So if I want to verify that, then I would need to really go through the application or automate the application through the UI, because otherwise I'm not, not testing what my users are uh, uh, expecting from my application. Yeah, this is, uh, for one test, this is pretty good, but you can imagine that there are a lot of functional uh, scenarios, there are a lot of stories that you would like to verify in your, in your application. So typically what you would have as a result is a lot of tests that are testing your functionality over the, on the UI. However, we said that uh, the UI is slow and costly, so this is not really a, an efficient solution. At least uh, uh, we cannot really uh, scale it up for, for bigger applications. In terms of the testing pyramid, sometimes it's also called uh, testing uh, ice cream or uh, something like that. So it's a reverse shape somehow. Good. So this would be the ideal case, but unfortunately, because testing, UI testing is slow and costly, we have to make a compromise. Okay. We have to make a compromise, and one compromise would be that, okay, we are not testing these guys through the UI, but some kind of layer below that, which is which can give us fast feedback and, uh, and more predictable results. Okay? But this is a compromise. This means that by doing this, by making this decision, we have introduced a kind of testing gap. So it can happen that all of our tests are passing, still our users cannot use our application. Right? So we would need to fill up this testing gap. And probably there are a lot of choices how you can fill up this testing gap. And you don't necessarily have to always think about test automation. Testing is a is a, is a holistic strategy, or it should be in your, in, your, in your system. And maybe you have some other ways of doing that. Maybe you are doing manual testing, crowd, source, crowd testing, or whatever else you can do for, for filling up this, this testing. But you have to be aware that just, by, just because you lowered the layer of your test, actually you have introduced this gap that you have to fill up. One option to fill up this, uh, this gap would be that, let's say that generally our functional tests are automated in the, in the service level, but some of our tests are somehow automated through the UI. Okay, and then what, you, what we can have is a kind of nicer balance in terms of the testing pyramid, because all the variation of data, how many pizzas you are ordering, can be tested fastly on the service layer, and we have at least one test from the pizza selection scenarios from every feature, which is really testing it whether altogether this also works through the UI. Okay, so this could be one option. If you don't want to have this option, you have still some other, uh, other, other choices. So let's say that we keep all of our tests, all of our functional tests in the service level, but we are introducing a, a technical test, which is just testing whether our service level is, is properly connected to our UI. Depending on the uh, UI infrastructure you use, it's either easy or, or hard, but you can make a test for that. However, this test is not a functional test anymore, and you have to be aware of that. This is not testing your functionality. It doesn't matter which data is used, which, which uh, a use case was, uh, was introducing that. Here, you are only testing whether your, your technical infrastructure works well together. If you, test the, if you make this as a UI test, this is like a smoke test. So you're just running your application and making sure that the UI is, uh, is responsive. Maybe in other systems, you can also do this as a unit test, especially in web applications. Maybe this is just a... Uh, a JavaScript unit test, which is just te testing whether, whether it's well connected to the backend. Okay, so <clears throat> there are several options, and you have to find your own uh, way of doing that. So we have seen a couple of uh, 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 tests that we have placed in the, on, the, on the testing pyramid. Maybe we can find a, a few more. So maybe sometimes you can think about other kind of functional tests, maybe some edge case tests or very specific tests, and you would say that if the function which is implemented by that, uh, that, uh, that requirement is really implemented by a unit, why not test it as a unit test? Just ima imagine that uh, maybe for the pizza application there is a shipping cost or whatever, a delivery cost. The delivery cost calculation is probably implemented by a single unit. To be able to test that whether the cost is pro properly calculated, you probably don't have to go through the UI or even on the service layer. You can just implement it as a unit test. 
We have mentioned the smoke test already. We can think about other kinds of tests. And, uh, and uh, you can see that, uh, that uh, the different kinds of uh, quality criteria can be really tested in different levels. We didn't mention any usability kind of test, but if you think about uh, 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 a test which is checking whether your, your method is well documented in a sense that if it, uh, let's say that it doesn't allow a null parameter, and if you call it with null, then it throws an argu argument null exception. This test is actually a strategic test because it's not functional, of course, the user doesn't even know what null value is. It's also not a, a usability test because normally through the application no one should call it with null. It's more like a strategic test that if another developer will come later and they want to look at your method and know which are the preconditions of that method, then they can see, that, ah, okay, here I cannot pass in null, so, so this is something that uh, I have to consider. So different kinds of tests for different kinds of purposes. But what the outcome of this should be that unit testing is not the goal. Okay? So unit testing is a tool to, have, to achieve your, your, uh, your, uh, your goal. And you have to figure out what you want to have and then find a way how it's best, best, uh, fitting, what is best, best fitting to your goal. Okay? So just because you don't have a single unit test in your project is not necessarily bad if you, uh, reaching the, if you can get enough confidence uh, uh, that your quality is good is somehow uh, solved in another way. Good. <clears throat> so, so for functional tests, that's uh, what we said is that actually for functional the, for, for the functional quality, we would like to verify that our, our application works as expected. So the question is that how do we ensure this expected behavior? How do we write these uh, these tests? And. Uh, if you think about the, 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 the usual way of how agile projects are de delivered, and this is how I was working for many years, then at least based on my experience, it was always like that, that uh, okay, let's, there's a usual agile process. You have a user story. The team starts to work on that. They are implementing uh, some code. Do you know whether it satisfies the expected requirements? Hard to see, right? It's, uh, it's small enough letters. My wife is always saying that the problem is there are too many curly braces in there, but definitely it's a different abstraction level, so you cannot really answer whether your application is working as expected. So what you typically do, you run your application, check it manually, which is a quite slow feedback loop. It's, uh, it's not so easy to handle that. And even if you are working in sprints, it can happen that while you really get a, a, a user story finished, it can take even several sprints if you, uh, until you fix all the bugs that, that were found uh, in your application. To speed up this process, of course, we can have automated tests, which are, which I believe are not manual, and then at least we are shortening the time of, uh, of, this, uh, of this feedback loop, so we can, we can create automated tests. However, automated tests can be also dangerous, because it looks like that you get feedback from them, uh, but actually this feedback is only good until they are passing. If they start to fail, every, especially if it's uh, whatever, half a year, half a year lit, later, then you, you find yourself in a situation that, OK, I have this test. This is failing. It says uh, question test is a bunch of code. I need to understand what I wanted to do with this test to be able to verify whether actually now the test is wrong because the application is somehow changed or the application got a bug. So again, the problem is that, that this test is expressed with C sharp and a lot of curly braces. So you cannot read it out from that what the, what, what, what the expected behavior was. So you have to be very disciplined and uh, commenting, put a lot of comments in your tests to be able to realize that. So, and actually this is where, where BDD comes into the picture. BDD can also be seen as a, as a way to express your tests in a way that you are, you are making the intention, the, the goal that you wanted to, te to test in a much more visible way. So, by the way, I say BDD, which means behavior driven development. Sometimes you have, might have heard acceptance test driven development or specification by example. All these things are more or less the same. So uh, there are probably slightly differences, but, uh, but the core concept is, uh, is the same for all of these methodologies. So how does it work with BDD? So we have the same uh, input. So we have a user story, and we would like to have a working application at the end. However, when we work with BDD, what we are doing, 
when we are starting to discuss the requirements, we are trying to collect some examples. So collect some examples of the, of the application, how it should work when it will be implemented. Okay, and you typically can collect a bunch of examples for users to like, let's say like 10 or 20, but uh, all these examples are very concrete and saying that this is what will happen if the application will be implemented once. And interestingly, by collecting these examples, you will learn a lot of things about the application. So many things that are, are right now uh, addressed as a bug at the end, turns out it was just a misunderstanding or an unclear understanding of the requirements. So actually by collecting these examples, we have a very short feedback loop. No code has been written. These are just maybe pieces of paper. And uh, we already learned a lot about our, our, uh, our system. And once we have collected these examples, Maybe at the end, we typically I collect these examples in a, in a post-it notes, just a bullet point list in a pen, with a pen. However, once we agreed on these examples, maybe we can put a little bit of more formalism to that. So just uh, 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 writing it into a, a very loose syntax right now, uh, which is in, in, in the majority of the BDD2 Syscore scenarios. So I'm just turning all of my example into a scenario, which is using these given van then keywords. This is just the explaining the precondition or the context, uh, saying what I would like to do in this, uh, what was the important aspect of this test, and what, what I expected as a result. So I'm, I'm making a little bit of formali uh, formalism to that, which is just enough that some tools like Specflow or Cucumber can take it and can execute it as an automated test. I will show you uh, later on how, how this works. Okay, so basically we have another sh much shorter feedback loop. And in this case, whenever such a test is failing, I can, immediate, I can read the test and understand whether this test is still valid, so this means that my code is probably wrong, or this test is invalid because we anyway don't have an easy, easy answer anymore, but whatever, we have a more uh, complex solution uh, already. So, so this is basically the, the, the core uh, BDD process that uh, is actually in a, in a, in, done in three steps. So typically we have a discovery phase when we are understanding these examples and capturing them. We have a, this formalization part where we are phrasing them into given, when, then. And, and then we have the automation when we are using these uh, uh, scenarios as automated tests. Many people who are just uh, seeing first pack flow just focusing on the automation which is not bad, but it's not the full story. So you have to see the full story. <coughs> Good. So this is, uh, this is how uh, uh, the BDD uh, works in a, in a high level. So this, what you see as a scenario, this is an example. And this example serves different purposes. And uh, actually, there are three things that are important here. As we said, this example is, it serves as an illustration for the requirements. This is what we have used to better understand the requirements during the, the discussion phase. It works as an automated test, that's pretty obvious. And it also works as a documentation. So later on when you, have to, when you want to go back to the project and look at that, okay, how it's supposed to work, then you have a, then you have a well documented uh, set of examples which are stating how, how uh, you wanted it to work. So you can make some experiments, you can uh, make some consistency checks with another new feature and similar things. Okay, so, so these are the, the, the three aspects of that. Good. <clears throat> so, so we have learned a little bit about these functional tests and have seen that uh, for this functional test, especially to be able to express what was the expected behavior, it's not, not enough if we developers are, or together with the testers even, we do it alone because you need to have a feedback from the, from the business as well. You need to have a feedback from the product owner, business analyst, or, or the other side as well because otherwise you are just testing what you, how you understand it and not testing what was the expected behavior. So from this perspective, uh, some people like to turn this uh, 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 pyramid away. I think it's not so easy to turn a pyramid, but uh, I mean, in PowerPoint, you can do that. Uh, so if, if, if you turn this pyramid, then you get to something which is sometimes called the testing iceberg, uh, which is basically the same testing pyramid, but it shows that wherever you have tests in your testing pyramid, then there are some tests which are important for the business. So business interesting or should be business readable where you want to get feedback from the business whether this is really how, what you wanted to have. And there are some tests which are ensuring the technical aspect of that. So whether our application is really working as, as, uh, as we wanted, wanted it to work and, 
it fulfills the the other quality criteria of that. Okay, so this is how how you should see that, and uh, and this is how you should try to think about the the testing pyramid and, and trying to find the right uh, test types for your uh, for your application. Good. So this was a quick uh, summary, and now it comes the demo part. Uh, my demo is actually uploaded on GitHub, so you will be able to um, uh, check it out also yourself. And actually, I would like to show you uh, at least three different aspects. Let's see how much time I will have. So I would like to show you so, some basics about SpecFlow, so what is the, the general rhythm, how you work with SpecFlow. And I want to show you how you can test uh, the application in these two different levels, so how you can test it in the service level and how you can test it in the UI level and what are the different aspects of that. Okay, so... Are you ready for that? Yes. Good, good. You're you still not sleeping. That's very good. Uh, <coughs> and uh, and uh, actually, to be able to so for this demonstration, as I said, I uh, it's a pizza pizza ordering application. I was spending uh, at least half an hour to find a good uh, icon for this pizza, which is just shown you just for five seconds. So I'm just actually running my application. If you see some similarities between a to-do checking app and this, no, no, that's a completely different app. So this is a pizza ordering site. And actually, our pizza shop, which is called Geek Pizza, uh, has decided to name their pizzas not like the usual names, mar like Margarita or things like that, but they have picked some famous or uh, big influential names in the, in the behavior driven development community, and uh, all of their pizzas are named uh, after those guys. So... Uh, Right now, it just shows you the menu, and you cannot really do anything with that. And, uh, and actually, what we are about to do right now is to this selection, so somehow to be able to put these pizzas into the, the shopping cart so that we can order them later. And uh, let's say that uh, we had a discussion already on that, so we were doing this discovery phase. And uh, during this discovery phase, we have collected a couple of examples, actually five examples that, are, that were describing the... the uh, the behavior of our application in this case. I didn't detail all the examples fully, but uh, uh, you can probably imagine. So actually, we just realized that uh, for, this, uh, for this function, uh, we would like to target two different business goals or rules. Uh, one is that should, I should be able to select pizzas, where we finally found that our three examples for that, if you are just selecting a single pizza, if you are selecting multiple pizza, for example, an Essa Calasoy pizza and, um, and a Chris Matt's pizza, and, uh, and if you are selecting multiple pizzas of, of the same type, so these are the, there was the three important cases, at least based on our, the discussion of our team. And we also discussed that uh, probably should have some examples that how it's displayed so that, uh, and how the, generally the UI workflow works. So after selecting a pizza, the card should be automatically activated and also that, uh, that it should really prepare, uh, display the, the quantity and the name of the selected pizza. So these were the examples that we collected. And uh, the first one, we have already formulated into a scenario, and this is what you can see here now. So it says that uh, given I have an empty cart, when I select uh, the Uncle Bob's fitness pizza, then the cart should contain uh, actually this pizza. So this is a very simple example, but will be enough for me to show you how, how this can be done. As you, and as you have seen, the in this particular function is not implemented yet in the application. So I'm doing a kind of test-driven development kind of working. So I have a test, and I would like to implement this functionality uh, based on that test afterwards. So <clears throat> I just placed it uh, into, a, into a feature file, and since I have installed the Visual Studio extension to Visual Stu uh, the SpecFlow extension to Visual Studio, therefore it's provided me some syntax coloring and, uh, and uh, other different things. And the other thing what it provided that whenever I compiled my project, actually what you can see that in the text, uh, test explorer, I already have a test called select a pizza. Actually, this is, the, this is representing this scenario. So I could even run that right now. However, running this uh, scenario doesn't give any meaningful result because mm, SpecFlow just sees that, okay, I see that you have three steps and there are some English text probably. I doesn't even know that it's English. So there is some text about that, but but I don't know how to automate that. Uh, unfortunately, there is no artificial intelligence part that would realize how to automate such uh, steps. So I have to tell this, tell this to SpecFlow how to, make the, how to provide the automation for this, for this scenario. And uh, 
in, typically in the BDD tools, you have to do it in a way that you don't have to provide the automation for the entire scenarios. I don't have to write a method which is automating this scenario. However, I need to provide the automation for the individual steps. So I have to tell SpecFlow how to automate this step. I have to tell SpecFlow how to automate this one and also how to automate the dance step. So, and basically with that, you are making some small building blocks that can be later reused for other tests as well. So if I'm just automating this one, and you can make another scenario without extra coding, which is probably adding another kind of pizza or multiple pizzas of the same kind. Okay, so I have to provide these three uh, pieces of, of code uh, to be able to provide the automation. And right now, what, uh, what I want, uh, our, let's say that uh, our team has discussed all the different testing strategies, and they decided that they don't want to do a UI testing yet, or that's, that would be too slow for them. And they rather want to do a, a kind of service layer test. So somehow a layer below the UI, which is fast enough, but at least as close as the to the functionality as possible. And since this is a, an MVVM application, it's quite easy to see that probably the best way to do that, to do it in the view model layer automation. How many of you are somewhat familiar with MVVM? Good. So basically what we want to do, we want to automate this scenario by targeting the view model layer. So that's what we will do now. Uh, <clears throat> to be able to uh, get started, I'm just uh, uh, opening the, the generate step definitions command from, from, SpecFlow, uh, from the SpecFlow Visual Studio extension. And actually it says that, ah, you have three steps which are not automated yet. So I can just generate some skeleton code, some starting code uh, to be able to start with that. I already have a class, I don't want to generate a new class, I'm just copying these methods to the clipboard and I'm just pasting it into the class which I have already uh, prepared a little bit up front. So actually what you can see is that for these three steps, we have three methods or three method skeletons that are generated and by looking at these methods you can already have a feeling how the, how the matching between the, the steps and this, uh, these other methods which are called step definitions are done. Actually, they are provided through this given when or then attributes, and these attributes have some text in there, which is basically making the matching between the, the text of the step and the method itself. So basically what SpecFlow will do, it will go through your steps, try to find the method which is matching to that uh, step, and execute that step. You can also see that some of, our, some of my step definitions are actually parameterized. From that you can also see that this is not really a text what I'm providing here, but a regular expression, but I don't want to go into that. This is a way to provide some parameterized steps so that if you have different data variations, then you don't have to make a lot of code. So yeah, it's, a, a, it's just a parameterized step. Good, so let's try to automate this. And uh, uh, well, actually, we can start with the given steps. So given I have an empty card, actually right now my application is always starting with an empty card, so I don't really need to write anything into that. Of course, in this case, the question whether it would make sense to write this at all, so I could just delete it also here. But Still, I find, I, I find it good to, to document it that actually I want to start from an empty cart. Maybe later on I will be able to persist the cart and then I need to do something else. So probably what we should do here, we don't want to do any action because my cart is anyway empty, but maybe we could do an assertion that is really like that. Okay, that's a kind of safety that if later on we are introducing some other functions, then, uh, then this is really working as expected. So I'm just making an assertion like a collection assert dot is empty and uh, I'm just finding the, uh, the cart not so interesting. This is uh, how it is represented by my application. I have a kind of store which is representing the, the memory or the, the state of my application. The order is what represents the cart. It's an order to be done and the items is the items which I have in, the, in my shopping cart. So that was easy. So for the van step, actually we said that we want to automate it through the view model. So if I want to simulate somehow that somebody is selecting a, a, a pizza, if you remember our application, actually it was working like that, that uh, we were, uh, there is a, a main screen and actually I want to tap on it. So this is actually what I want to uh, simulate here. If you turn this down into the view model level, then actually what we need to have, we need to have a view model, view model, uh, which will be the main uh, no, it's even the pizza menu view model, so which I need to provide the store as a parameter to that. So I have a view model which is representing this uh, this list of pizzas, and uh, I want to simulate this step or just do some step tapping on that. If you know that if you know MVVM, then typically if you are want to make some actions, 
what you need to do in the view model. Make a command, right? So it's not implemented yet, so we need to figure out that, okay, well, how we should call this command, how we should call this command. Select pizza, maybe. Okay, so, uh, so basically what I want to say, I'm mean, doing a test-driven development, I can say that let's call it select pizza. So I say select pizza, and this is a command, so I need to call the execute uh, on that with the selected pizza as a parameter. Okay, so, so we need to find which pizzas do we want to select. Actually, we want to find it from the, from the menu. We need to find the one which the, 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 uh, the, t the step was telling to us. I'm just renaming this parameter because P0 is not really descriptive. So actually, this is the pizza name. So what I'm doing is that var item equals, I'm just trying to find this pizza in the pizza list. So view model dot items, this is the items that we display. And I'm just saying find uh, first or default uh, an item where the item name dot equals name is the pizza name. OK, so, so I found it. Probably I should make an assertion that it's really not null. And, uh, and actually, this is the item that I want to pass in uh, to the parameter of the, of, the, of the command. As you see, right now I'm designing how my interface will be. I design how, 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 what should be the input parameter of my command will be. So this is a test-driven thinking. Uh, <clears throat> actually, I have already created this command to save some time. And I think I was calling it somehow like uh, item tap command. So let's say that this is how we have decided to call it. OK, <clears throat> so, so I just have a command, but I, it doesn't do anything yet. Uh, in the then step, actually, we should verify whether a cart is containing the, the pizza. So again, we have a parameter. Uh, it's also, again, a pizza name. But this is not the, it's not just a pizza name. This is the expected pizza name. So I'm calling it expected pizza name. I hope that you are not hungry. Uh, and actually, what I would need to do, I would need to find whether this pizza is really added to, the, to my shopping cart or not. So what I'm doing is that uh, I'm just trying to find this. Uh, and uh, for the sake of simplicity, I'm just finding it in the store. Uh, so first store default. And, uh, and I find the pizza where the pizza name, not equals, but name, is the expected pizza name. So this is. Uh, I hope that, we, that this works, so we found it. So we have to make some assertions to be able to verify that. So first of all, we have to, uh, we have to verify whether it's not null. So assert dot is not null um, and item. OK, so basically, we made a verification whether we still really have such an item in our, in our shopping cart. So now we can run our tests. So let's run it. Will it pass or fail? Fail because we haven't implemented still the stuff. So, but it's a, it's a good failure, except that I haven't provided any meaningful error message. But actually, it says that you expected this is not now, but actually it's now. So please implement the stuff. Otherwise, uh, uh, this test is, 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 is still uh, failing. So this is the time in the, in the TDD cycle when I have a failing test. Now I have to make it pass. So I will just go to my application in the in, in, to my view model, and, uh, and I th have to think about how I'm implementing this uh, uh, command. And after a lot of thinking, and maybe a lot of unit tests as well, I finally come to a solution that uh, looks like good. So I can just verify, rerunning my test, and uh, hopefully it turns to green. It's now compiling, where I don't know what it does, waking up. So this should be the fast feedback loop that I'm showing. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes Visual Studio is uh, trying to sabotage this. Because as you can see, the test itself is just uh, uh, less than a, a second. But sometimes uh, it just uh, makes the compilation somehow crazy. But at the end, uh, we finally get a feedback. And if you have a, a better environment, then probably you can really get this feedback quite quickly. So now our test is passing. Can we go to the pub and have a drink? Yeah. Not yet, not yet, not yet. Uh, there are two problems. One is that uh, if you remember TDD, then it says red, green refactor. So we would need to review our code and see whether it's really we have implemented in the right way. So maybe we can make some improvements in the code. And the other thing that you forgot that actually we also said that 
we are now testing it only in the service layer. It can happen that it doesn't work in the UI. So probably we would also need to make some manual tests as well uh, to be able to verify whether it's really working in the application. So, and after that, if it's really working after that, then we can probably go to the pub and have a drink. And then of course, continue with the, with the next scenario. Good, I don't want to continue with the next scenario. However, I'm just uh, implementing uh, some kind of uh, uh, fast forward time strategy. So let's imagine that it's already implemented. And uh, I'm just switching to another uh, branch. <clears throat> and uh, in this branch, actually, uh, I have uh, all of my other scenarios already automated. And all of them are automated uh, uh, through this view model layer. So if I really patient enough to wait until Visual Studio is compiling my solution, then I could just run all my tests and they will be running, the actual execution of all of the tests will be uh, hopefully less than a second. So even if you have hundreds of tests, I can really get a quick feedback. There are even tools which are doing it in a way that as you code, they are just rerunning your tests. So this is, what, uh, this is the feedback thing that we would like to have. However, this is only done in the, 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 the service level, or in our case, this is the view model layer. And we said that maybe we also would like to do this on the UI level as well, right? And we have seen the different strategies. And, and you remember that we were saying a strategy that we want to have the majority of our tests in the view model layer, but maybe one, we want to make it in the, in the, in the, uh, in the, as a UI test. So let's say that in our case, let's select this one, this first one, by the way, I have the compilation in the meanwhile. So let's select this first one. I want to say that I want to have all of them running on the, on the view model, but at least this one, I would like to run it through the UI. Okay. So what I can do in, um, in this uh, Gherkin format, actually you can tag your scenarios. Tag can be used for anything you want. And uh, for example, you can just highlight with a tag what kind of, how, how do you want to automate that? So let's say that I'm just uh, putting a mobile uh, tag on that, indicating that I want to have this one running through UI automation. Okay. Uh, now, there is a slight problem because actually we said that we have implemented some step definitions to, that we're providing the given, the implementation for a given and a when and the then steps. And however, in this case, I might have the same, exact same step that, uh, so as you can see, I have the when I select the Uncle Bob pizza, and I have exactly the same step, which is different data. And once I want to run it through, in the more UI automation, once I want to run it through the, the uh, view model, that's a little bit of collision that I, I would need to um, uh, resolve. Uh, but actually, I did that. So uh, I have a class where I have automated all of my steps through the view model. However, I have another steps class which, where I have automated all of these steps uh, with the UI automation framework. So you, if you have used that, you, you, you know that that is an app.tap or app.back and, and things like that. Uh, <clears throat> now, this is somehow configured in a way that uh, whenever I was doing the, the mobile automation uh, part of that, I was just uh, providing a scope that uh, actually these step definitions should only be uh, considered if the scenario is tagged with mobile. Okay, so this is, a, this is how SpecFlow makes a distinction whether this one should be running or the other one. So now if I would run this, which I will probably not because uh, it, it would take uh, too much time, then what would happen that except the select pizza, all of them would be running uh, uh, very quickly. However, the select pizza would be taking up like, like a half minute uh, to be able to execute things. So as you can see now, we implemented a kind of pyramid-like uh, infrastructure, so majority of the tests we can use to have a, a quick feedback. And of course, I can also use Visual Studio to make a, a filtering for that. So if I, I just want to run the fast test, I can just say that minus trait and, uh, uh, and say that I want to run everything which is not mobile. Because uh, actually, SpecFlow is turning these tags that you put on your uh, scenarios into traits or categories. So if I would recompile that, then actually the select a pizza uh, is disappearing from, that, from this list. So if I, I can just uh, uh, very quickly rerun all of my uh, view model tests. As you can see, they are really running fast. So you can, you can use these tools um, as you want. Uh, of course, I could also say that, hmm, that's interesting. So basically, I've automated all the steps through the UI. 
and also, also all the straps through, through the view model, that's fine. But actually, overnight, I have a lot of time, or, as, or, or the weekend, why can't we just rerun everything through the UI over the weekend or on a nightly build? That would be also good, right? Because normally during the day we have a fast feedback. However, when we have more time, or maybe we can uh, uh, send it to the test cloud, uh, it can work on the, uh, on the automation part. Of course, one solution would be that just to tag all the scenarios with mobile. I mean, with, uh, uh, with Specflow, I could even tag the entire feature file with mobile, and then it would run all the tests through the mobile. Actually, I was doing this already, so I can just show it to you as a, in a video in a little bit speed up. I think it's uh, eight times faster than, than it is in the reality. So actually, what you will see now, I will just run the run all button. And as you can see, all of the tests are tagged with mobile. And what you will see is that it will just go through all the tests and, uh, and automating it through the application. Exactly the same tests that we were using for, for uh, uh, View, view model automation as well. The reason why we, was a, why we were able to do this is that because we have ex, uh, uh, expressed our scenarios based on the expected behavior. So there was no technical, technical steps in there. You, you haven't seen anything that I'm clicking on the button with ID 1, 2, 3, 4, but it was saying it with the business language, uh, which in BDD sometimes we are calling the ubiquitous language. And, uh, and this can be automated in different ways. Okay, so, so this is how it works. Good. Uh, <clears throat> actually, this one is still not fully convenient because I need to change all of my feature files overnight to be able to run everything uh, on the mobile. So what we really want to do is a more like a dynamic switching. So depending on an environment variable or maybe an app config setting or something like that uh, 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 to be able to do that. And actually, you can also do that. Uh, I have a... I have another branch for that. I will not uh, run anything there, and then I, um, I will really finish. Uh, you can also do that. Uh, and actually, this is also, so to be able to do some kind of dynamic selection of the, of, of the automation platform, what is really useful is that you are, if you look at such a solution, a, a test automation solution, then and you are looking at it with the, with the developer's eyes where you want to have a single responsibility principle, then you will see that typically these kind of codes are doing two different things. They are doing some automation things. So how do I select a pizza? In one case, I have to call a, method, a, a, a command in the view model. In the other case, I have to tap a button. And the other is the testing aspect. So how do I, what should I use as a default pizza? Uh, how do I do the assertions? And all these things are not related to automation. These are related to, uh, to the testing. So basically, if you are looking after that and uh, you are trying to separate your code between uh, automation and testing, then what you can come up with is that you are probably can make some, some drivers, which are basically the encapsulation of all the, all the automation aspect of, uh, of your application. In my case, since my application is really simple, I have just a simple in single interface. In the real application, you, have, you probably have multiple different aspects. For example, the page object model is the same, same pattern, if you have heard about that. In my case, it turned out that in terms of automation, I actually needed these five different things uh, uh, to be able to uh, automate the, my application. And so I have defined it as an interface. And right now, I have two implementations for that. One is uh, uh, implementing these steps uh, with the view model. Uh, this is the things that we have seen. So it just, uh, uh, whatever, creates a new model in instance and it fires the, the command. And I have also another one which is just doing the same with the UI automation where I'm just, um, I don't know, tapping, uh, I don't know where it is, tapping buttons and things like that. And this way, I can even, so this is now object-oriented code. So you can, I have now a hierarchy of, of different ways of automating. So if it turns out that generally this is the way how you can do the automation in mobile, but it turns out that one single step has to be slightly done slightly differently in iOS than in Android, you can still make even more derived classes of this and just make it virtual and whatever override that. So you can still customize this automation to the different kind of devices uh, or the different platforms that you want to do. So you have a little bit more flexibility to, uh, uh, to instead of making ifs everywhere in the code, you can basically use the, the power of object-oriented uh, principles to do that. Okay, so this is the way, and then, then uh, you can find some uh, uh, 
you can somehow configure spec flow that depending on some uh, values in my case, this is just uh, taking an environment variable and depending on what the environment variable is, in one case it's using the Android UI app driver as an iApp driver, in other case it's using the, the, the ViewModel app driver. And basically by that I can make a dynamic switch. So I can just run my, in, inside my Visual Studio, I can always run it uh, through the view model, and maybe I have a console, app, uh, console window when I'm just regularly kicking off the UI execution as well, or this is what I'm doing in the, on the build server or on the test cloud or, or wherever you want. Good. <clears throat> so I don't have any, any way much time. So actually this is what I uh, wanted to cover. So basically uh, uh, these are the things that we have seen in the, in the, uh, in the demo. One thing that I should really highlight is that Xamarin is not only good because you can share code between the different implementations. This is of course the typical, uh, the biggest value of that. So you can share code between iOS and Android, but you can also share tests as well. That's also a big benefit. So, uh, and especially if you are using the portable class library, it's even better. So think about that. Good. So let's wrap up and, uh, and then I let you go. Uh, so I think the, 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 the thing that you should remember from this session, besides that you should, uh, uh, if you are interested, you should try out uh, SpecFlow and, uh, uh, and this, is, uh, this can be really useful for you. But generally, even if you are not using SpecFlow, what you should really uh, take care of that you should find your own testing strategy. There are no fixed recipes for that. There is even a, uh, a test-driven, uh, context-driven, uh, context-driven uh, testing school, so which are saying that there are every testing strategy should be really specific to the application needs. Try to think about what are the quality criteria that are important for your application. Try to find the right tools to address these quality criteria in a way that you get enough confidence to be able to do uh, regular releases and uh, uh, continuous deployment, continuous delivery, and, uh, and uh, this is how you can uh, express that. And especially for functional tests where you should really take care of really capturing the expected behavior. So you have to have a review from, from somehow from the business side and really the tools can help in that. Okay. So that was it for today. Happy testing and thank you very much. <laughs> My this is this, the, the link for my slide, so if you go there, I, I try to make it somehow rememberable, uh, then you get uh, to the slide share and, uh, and then you can uh, find the slide. And uh, what I wanted to say is that I have a couple of spec flow stickers, so if you want to have, uh, take a, a few spec flow stickers, bring it to your colleagues, just uh, come to here afterwards and, uh, and, and, and don't forget to take uh, from them. And I'm really happy to answer any questions even though that I'm massively over time now. At least have two minutes over time, it's not much. <laughs> but I will be here around, so you can just uh, uh, come to me afterwards. Yeah. Thank you very much. There is no reason not to use uh, uh, like a spec flow because it's going to make your applications better, it's going to make everything <coughs> I've, been doing, I've been using spec flow since like forever, and uh, it just saves the world. So uh, use it, please.